Um, good morning, everyone. Um, today, uh, we're happy to have uh, Ken Van Kibuk uh, giving a talk. Um, Ken uh, obtained his PhD 2016 from Stanford with Professor Savas Dimopoulos. And after that, he had a joint postdoc position between the IAS, so you were a member here, IAS and NYU. Uh, then you had a postdoc position at uh, the Cowan Institute for Theoretical Physics at the University of Santa Barbara. And uh, uh, since 2020, Ken uh, is an assistant professor uh, joined between the CCA and, and NYU. And today he's going to enlighten us on the stellar basins of gravitationally bound particles. Ken, please take it away. Thank you, Misha. Feel free uh, to take off your mask. It's uh, great to be back here. Um, so I, I work uh, primarily on uh, particle astrophysics and particle physics. So. Um, maybe a little bit something on the periphery of, of everyone's expertise here. So please, please stop me uh, whenever you want to ask a question. I'm happy to write stuff on the board. Uh, so today I will talk about um, player to work. Oh, I guess it doesn't work on a TV. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just point with my, <laughs> with my finger. So today I will talk about stellar basins. Uh, so uh, I'm showing a little, uh, animation here. So, so what it is, is a, uh, it's emission of uh, weakly coupled particles like axions or dark, uh, dark photons. So particles beyond the standard, thank you. Particles beyond the standard model, um, which uh, I posited in this first paper can uh, be emitted into bound orbits. So what you see here is the sun in the middle and then Venus, Earth, and Mars and, and Jupiter here on the periphery. The, I guess you're far away. The tick mark here is uh, the tick marks there are in AU. So you see the planets orbiting, and everything that's not on a circular orbit basically are these uh, newly emitted particles. Um, so I, I proposed this here uh, in summer of 2020 uh, for a case study of axions in particular. And then with Robert Lazenby, the postdoc at Stanford, uh, we studied the case of uh, dark photons, which is uh, probably the most dramatic. Uh, uh, case. And then uh, still with Robert and a student at NYU, we're studying the orbital evolution of the si system just under, under gravity, uh, as you'll see that, it, that it's quite important. And then last week, we had a, a paper with, so Will DeRocco is a postdoc at Santa Cruz, Shalma Wixman, a student at NYU, Ryan Reffenstead, uh, a new star expert uh, at Caltech, and Junwu Huang, who's a faculty at Perimeter. Uh, about indirectly detecting the presence of this uh, population of particles. Okay. And this working on it. Okay. Yeah, so um, just to give you a, a brief overview. So stars, uh, including the sun here, are actually quite bad at emitting photons, which is good for us. That means that uh, star stars are long lived and, and culture can develop. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, there's two main reasons for, for the long lifetime of stars. Uh, so the, the core of the sun, for example, is extremely hot. It's 15 million Kelvin, but the surface is quite cool. And so emission goes like uh, temperature to the fourth. So the fact that uh, you can only emit from the surface uh, suppresses the emission and increases the lifetime of the sun. Um, the, the, and the second reason is, I mean, I've, I've got, kind of already implied it, uh, you only emit from a small layer on the surface, not the entire volume of the star. Um, and so it was uh, known already, I think in the early 1940s, that neutrinos can, can uh, constitute a substantial um, um, uh, amount, so they can contribute a substantial amount to the cooling of stars. So for the, for the sun, it's only a few percent. Um, uh, work on that was, was done here at Princeton as well in IS. Um, but uh, for other stars, including neutron stars, uh, it can be uh, quite significant. And in fact, for the first 100,000 years of a neutron star's life, the main emission, so the main luminosity, uh, so energy loss rate, uh, total energy loss rate uh, is in a neutrino emission, not in photon emission, which only overtakes it after about 100,000 years. Um, Okay, and the, and the reason is, so, so neutrinos have an ex exceedingly tiny effective coupling. The effective coupling goes like a G Fermi squared times the temperature, the temperature to the fourth, which is to be compared with uh, powers of the fine structure constant, which are not that 
small. Um, and uh, yeah, and so and, and the reason is so, so, so you emit from the entire volume and you, you have access to the core temperature, not just the surface temperature. Um, and so then it was realized in the late 70s that uh, new particles beyond the standard model can also be emitted uh, from stars, including the sun. And so they can lead to anomalous cooling of the sun or uh, compact remnants uh, or, or more extreme stars like the very hot cores of horizontal branch stars or, or red giants. Um, and you can detect them perhaps directly on Earth if they're emitted by the sun. Uh, and so that program has set um, historically the, the, the world, world leading bounds on the couplings of new particles, including axions. Um, so the, so, and, and that's just if the particles exist in sort of the, the theory in the Lagrangian, you can produce them in stars. Uh, you can also look for these types of particles if they're dark matter. If they're weakly coupled enough, they may constitute uh, dark matter. They, they can behave uh, effectively pressureless. Uh, and again, you can look for them with uh, earthbound detectors, um, often the same ones that you look that you use to look for solar axions. Um, so my idea from, from summer of 2020 was uh, a basic observation that it's just you're not just emitting from the volume of the star, and that's that's the one thing that's different from photon emission. Um, typically, these new particles have a mass as well, right? So unlike for photons, there can be bound orbits around the star. And the amount of phase space available for emission into these bound orbits is extremely small. Um, but the, the saving grace is that uh, they can accumulate over time. So despite this extremely tiny uh, flux into bound orbits, they accumulate over time. And as I'll show later, they can actually dominate the local energy density. So the bound population of these axions can exceed the unbound population at Earth. And close to the surface of the star, the, the energy densities in these new particles can be uh, enormous. Okay, and so, so I, I just like to stress that I'm not uh, positing some uh, new model. I'm, I'm going to consider the leading effective operators that new particles can have to the standard model. So models that have been studied to death. And what, I'm, what I'll be pointing out is that there's this new phenomenon there. Um, so if you have a new particle, a new light particle that can be produced in a star, uh, so single production of a particle, the, the leading operators one has to consider is uh, are those of a scalar, pseudoscalar, or vector with couplings to electrons, quarks, photons, and gluons. And then here the structure changes a little bit, but it's the same for uh, particles one couples to. And then for a vector, there's effectively two possibilities. There's a kinetic mixing of a hidden photon. Um, with the regular electromagnetic current. So just for this A prime, uh, just imagine that uh, it couples just like a regular photon, except with a, a coupling suppressed by that, by that factor epsilon that I wrote over there. Or you can couple to baryon number minus lockdown number with a small gauge coupling little g. Um, OK, so uh, in, the, in the first paper that I have, in the first case that I'll discuss here, I'll talk about the pseudoscalar coupling, so this axion coupling to, to electrons. And uh, the, the two main processes to produce these particles are then just the axion version of Bremsstrahlung, where you, where you have an electron electron or electron ion scattering. And in the process, you emit an axion, uh, sort of final state radiation. And then an analog of the Compton process, where you replace the final uh, outgoing photon with an axion. And so this green dot is, is the, an insertion of that small coupling. Um, uh, in the second half of the talk, I'll also talk about uh, just the coupling to photons. So, so there, the main production channel is the Primakov effect. And also, this can lead to uh, axion, decay, axion decaying. So these particles can, can decay uh, to, to two photons. And if they're heavy enough, then those photons might be detectable, as we'll show. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, and even if you try to shut off this coupling to photons as much as you can, you can never uh, forbid a uh, decay to photons through a loop, but it's, it's quite slow. And then uh, I'll also discuss the analogous processes for vector like particles. Uh, and, the, and in that case, the decay is uh, super slow. So, so my general claim will be um, that for 
uh, any of these 10 couplings, I think in the right now or in the near future, the, the leading constraints on these couplings um, <clears throat> will be set by, by the phenomena that, that I'll talk, talk about. Um, yeah, for, for masses are, are in a few orders of magnitude around a kilo electron volt. So near the temperature of stars. Uh, yeah, so, so here I talked about single production of particles. Uh, Asher Berlin uh, at NYU and Caitlin Schutz uh, at McGill uh, have thought about pair production of fermions and we're actually, so Chris, Christina Mondino and I are collaborating with them to think about pair production of bosons for which, uh, which you can ask me about later. There's some interesting uh, physics there. Okay, so, um, but, but back to the case study of axions. So this is the effective theory. So I'm considering a free scalar called A with the mass uh, little m and now a coupling to electrons. So, so this axion couples to, um, uh, with a derivative coupling to, to the um, axial vector current of electrons. Um, and what I'm plotting here is the axion mass in keV. So I'm sorry, it's kind of a small font. So from 0.1 keV, 1 keV, 10 keV to 100 keV. Uh, and this gray region here is excluded by uh, anomalous cooling of red giants. So if, if you're anywhere in this, in this gray region here, then you, the cores of red giants would, would lose energy too much uh, in conflict with observations and basically the lifetime of the red giant phase. Um, and there's a similar argument for white dwarf cooling, which is a, a tiny bit stronger by, by and, sorry, by 30% or so. And there you would, you know, if, if you're anywhere, uh, above that line, you would distort the luminosity function of white dwarfs and, and a few other processes. There are some hints that, that there are, uh, there is cooling of white dwarfs, but I don't believe them. So don't pay attention to the screen then. Um, yeah, so, um, and here I'm showing a spectrum for the for this, uh, axion emission from the sun as a function of energy. So for those two couplings, so for the axion electron coupling, it's that first one, uh, it's a combination of uh, Compton production and Bremsstrahlung. The peak here is roughly at the core temperature of the sun, which is in which in KV is 1.3 KV. In KV, is, uh, yeah, 1.3 KV in, in sort of energy units. Uh, and for the axion photon coupling, it's this blue curve. The spikes here um, have been modeled before. So those are atomic processes. Uh, I, I, I will not be including them in my talk. So I'm, I'm only modeling the sort of the smooth. Distribution. Just uh, any questions about this? Okay, so we're looking for effectively uh, this coupling, this dimensionless coupling. Um, so what I showed, the spectrum I showed on the previous plot was for effectively a massless axion. So here is a little cartoon of the energy loss per unit volume per unit energy. And so if you take, for example, the spectrum from Bremsstrahlung and you set the axion mass to zero you get this uh, uh, gray curve here. So, so this gray dashed curve, which overlaps with the black at high, high energies. Um, and basically at low energies, you're suppressed by uh, phase space, right? Just like the, uh, just like let's say the CMB, uh, Kobe curve. Um, and and at, high temper at high energies, you're suppressed uh, by, by Boltzmann suppression. So there's the E to the minus uh, omega T suppression. Um, now, if the axion does have a mass, so let's put the mass a, a little bit below the temperature, um, then the spectrum is slightly modified. Of course, you can't emit uh, energies, uh, total energies below the mass. You need to have at least uh, uh, enough, uh, enough energy to create the rest mass energy of the particle. So the spectrum is, looks like the black curve. But now something fundamentally different can happen, which is that uh, you know, the, for, for energies in this blue sliver, so if your energy uh, is just enough to, to create the, the rest mass energy of the particle, um, plus some kinetic energy, which is below the, uh, which is low enough so that the, the, the effective velocity is below the escape velocity of the particle, then everything in this blue sliver will be uh, emitted into bound orbits. Um, and so as you can see, basically because V escape in units of the speed of light is about 10 to the minus three in the core of the sun. This is an extremely tiny sliver. Um, so 
uh, yeah, so to give you some idea, so, so let's, let's consider any sort of general process of standard model scattering, uh, but in the process I emit uh, some, some axion at low momenta. If you just want to estimate how big that sliver is, uh, the way you do it is, is you do the following. So this Q, this energy loss rate for unit volume, um, is some integral over all of the incoming momenta, outgoing momenta, including the axion momentum. So let me just write it as the integral over the axion free momentum. And then there is some uh, matrix element for, for this whole process, some other integrals but, uh, that I'm suppressing. Um, so if for the, for the full energy loss rate, it's the, uh, it's the integral under the curve. And then you know, this, this uh, prefactor here, this D3K omega will give you roughly temperature to the fourth, right? Those are, that's the one energy scale available to you. Um, but if you're considering just the area in the, in the blue sliver, uh, then you have to cut off the momenta at the mass times the escape velocity. And then also the, the energy of the particle is just the, the rest mass. So, so instead of t to the fourth, you get m to the fourth times the escape cubed. So you effectively find that the ratio, uh, so the ratio of these two numbers is, is the, the ratio of the blue sliver to the full integral. Uh, so that's kind of a heuristic derivation, but it is, it is correct. If you do it in detail, uh, I won't worry with it, but uh, what you find um, is a universal density profile that falls off as one over R to the fourth um, for, for this bound emission. So this is the, the energy density injection rate at effectively at some radius R away from the core of the star. So farther away from the star, it, it falls off pretty steeply. It's proportional to the mass of the star because you need to bound the particles. Uh, it's also phi here is the gravitational potential. And here, this integral is over the volume of the star. So, so Q is energy loss rate per unit volume into bound orbits, and, and, uh, and you're integrating that over the entire emission volume. Um, and just for comparison, I'm also, uh, I also have listed here rho infinity. So that's just a relativistic flux. That, that's the energy density uh, at radius R from the relativistic flux going out, right? So, so this uh, integral here is um, the total luminosity in axions. And uh, to compute the energy density locally, you have to divide by four pi r squared just from, from Gauss's law. So the, the, after some time tau, I can compute uh, the energy density uh, from, this, from this basin. So I multiply the blue with some accumulation time tau and divide by the energy density from the relativistic flux, and, and I'll, I compare. So as promised, there's you know, this effective ratio here. Um, this V escape cubed effectively, that's the small number, right? That's, that's why, you know, from the fact that the sliver is so, so much smaller here. And it's, it's not V escape cubed. If, you're, if you want to be more precise, it's V escape at some radius R. So, so what I mean here is uh, I, I have the sun here um, and I'm computing density at some radius R. Uh, and so orbits that will contribute or any orbit that, that crosses a radius r. So what you're sensitive to is the escape velocity squared at, at the radius r uh, times the escape velocity at, at the emission point, let's say in the core of the sun. Yeah. And the distraction by the magnetic field is too slow? The field is too weak? So these particles don't, uh, th there is one exception, um, but, but these axions don't, don't interact with magnetic fields at all. So, so they, they just basically go on Keplerian orbits um, for the most part. Uh, there's some interesting, uh, I'll, I'll talk about orbits in a second. There's some interesting stuff. So, so they're emitted from the core of the sun. So in the, in the very beginning, as they're emitted, they actually feel a potential that's not a one over R potential. So they undergo rapid perihelion precession in here, which affects their orbits, but they're unaffected by magnetic fields. Uh, the one exception, uh, the one exception is uh, are these particles called uh, Milli charged particles. So if you have a dark photon and particles charged under that new new gauge group, um, if if the dark photon mixes with our photon, then those Milli charged particles can be affected, and uh, that can be important. It was ignored in this paper on purpose, but uh, yeah, that. 
but that could only lead to more effective trapping because the gyro radius would be even That's smaller. because you're only considering pseudoscalars and vectors and not the scalars, right? The scalars would also similarly be unaffected by magnetic fields. Yeah. These particles, these particles are not charged under electromagnetism. Okay, so. so so I mean, of course, the electrons and, and all the standard model, model particles are affected by magnetic fields. But these these particles, they they get, you know, so so I'm gonna I'll draw the sun again. So you have the sun here, and let's say inside the core, the, the main production process is so in the core of the sun where the density is high, you have a photons, a photon scatters with an electron, and in and in that process, you have Compton production of an axion. And that axion, I mean, that axion basically doesn't interact with matter at all. I mean, it interacts a little bit, but it, its mean free path is much larger than the radius of the sun, so it escapes. Mo most of the flux goes to infinity and escapes the solar system, but, but a tiny fraction uh, goes into a Keplerian orbit or a pseudo Keplerian orbit. So we've heard a lot about various particles that decay uh, in the presence of, so they are coupled to the mm -hmm. ENM theory yes. through another term, right? So this is yes. a, right, this right. Is another type of coupling, right? So. Yeah, yeah, so, so you may have heard, so, so the, the primary way to look for uh, axions right now, dark matter axions, for example, is through this axion coupling to photons. Um, so that can be a way to detect them in the lab, but it, it's quite weak. And so you you may worry, you may worry that if if I have some magnetic field here, uh, that I can deflect the axion. But but those processes are exceedingly small, and 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 one may worry about processes like um, an axion coming along, and in in the presence of some magnetic field of the sun, for example, it can convert into uh, effectively an electric field or a photon. Those processes are suppressed for the massive particles that I talked about. Okay, so to just one last question. Yeah. So the, the, the top, so I understand much better now. So the yeah. top one is the interaction with the uh, with the electron, let's say, yeah. and the bottom one is the inter the coupling with the ENM field. This, this the, one is, yeah. Right, well, uh, just for overall your table. Everything, yeah. Of, uh, yes. So my question is, is the A in the top line mm -hmm. and the A coupling on the second line, like let's say for the pseudoscalars, mm -hmm. are they physically related to one another or are they the same thing? Are they different things? Are they just arbitrary constant of coupling that uh, can independently vary or do they have to be connected? That's a very good question. Um, so so they can be independently changed, but not by a whole, a whole lot. In quantum field theory, if uh, things things have to, if, if if you couple two electrons, electrons coupled to photons. So, for example, if you if you want to suppress the decay to photons uh, by let's say making this coupling arbitrarily small, you'll succeed, but only up to a point, right? Because uh, axions coupled to electrons, and electrons can go in a loop and, and through a virtual process that can emit photons. So, typically, if if you want the full story, so the Lagrangian is this coupling. Uh, let, let me write it slightly differently with some, some coefficient here uh, that I'll call CE over some decay constant. So this is the axion electron coupling, if I write it precisely. Uh, and then I can separately write um, this is alpha is a fine structure constant. I can separately write the axion coupling to uh, uh, electromagnetism. And so here, here I've I mean, I've made it suggestive. So in most models, this F and that F are the same. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, the, there is an integer here. That integer can be zero. Uh, it, it's called, it's, it's related to anomaly cancellation. So, so because it's an integer, it's not a tuning to set it to zero. So I can shut off the, cu the coupling to photons if I wish. This C coefficient can be one or at most, uh, ten to the minus three or so, but 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 generally, generally they're related like this. So where this integer is of order one, and this coupling is either one or ten to the minus three or so. Um, and I'll show some plots later. So yeah. So it typically one can produce the particle either way, and they're kind of comparable. That's a very good question. Yeah. Often what's done in the literature is consider one coupling at a time for simplicity, but that's not always a good assumption.
Yeah. Um, all right. So yeah. So you're uh, you're trying to emit these bound particles that are gravitationally interacting with all all bodies in the solar system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would they st stay? Their semi-major axis be conserved, or do they actually get scattered away? Because we don't see many up many bodies below, let's say the Earth or even the Jupiter. Spot. It's a very good question. It's, uh, and so that's in fact the topic. Uh, I'll get to that on the next slide. So when I first wrote the paper uh, in in June 2020, I had absolutely no clue. Um, so I made some guesses. So sorry, first first let me finish this story, right? So so. The ratio of emission goes like V escape cubed uh, if the mass is the mass of the particle is near the temperature of the star. And so this is a small number. This is something like um, V escape locally is about 10 to 30 kilometers, sorry, 40 something kilometers per second. So in units of the speed of light, this, this square is n minus eight, that's n minus three. So the thing in the red box is never larger than uh, 10 to minus 11 or so. Um, but the big number here is the accumulation time, which I'll get to in a second, divided by the radius. Uh, and units of speed of light is one. So that's the accumulation time could perhaps be the age of the sun, um, uh, uh, 4.6 billion years. And R here is the distance to the sun, which is eight minutes. So I have a small number here, which is 10 minus 11 at best, but a big number, which is the age of the sun over the light travel time to the sun, which is a big number. And indeed, if you work it out carefully, if the accumulation time is longer than a million years, then locally, this bound density is bigger than the relativistic uh, fluxes density. So basically, what we're looking for is a is a, a, a an effective gravitational lifetime under planetary perturbations, etc. That's longer than a million years, uh, and then locally, the density would be dominated by the by the bound orbits rather than the orbits or the the emission the the unbound orbits that just pass through once. And in the first bit, in my first paper, I had no idea. So I said, okay, well, at least just a very conservative assumption, at least it has to be sort of two the up enough times. The, the solar system is chaotic um, after some time scale. So uh, I can, in secular perturbation theory, it, it shouldn't change too much. But, but after this time, I have no way of, of knowing what happens. There, there can be exchanges of energy, slingshots, et cetera, but it should be at least as long as that. And then, as you say, uh, there's not that many minor bodies in the in the inner solar system, and and so that um, that fact had been used by others to look at uh, to, to look at uh, near Earth objects and asteroids and look at their rate of uh, ejection from the solar system. They're somewhat biased, uh, so the ones that come near Earth are typically in motional resonances and effectively on their way out of the solar system. Plus there's a further problem, which is that on roughly uh, ten, uh, on a few tens of millions of years, they hit the sun or they burn up near the sun. Whereas these particles, once they cross the sun, they effectively pass and return. So it's a little bit difficult to extrapolate from here. Also, they're all in the ecliptic plane. Whereas these, these orbits, these orbits go, uh, I'll, I'll show you some animations later, but they go just spherically symmetrically out of the sun. Uh, the most optimistic, that one could be is the, the age of the sun, let's say 4.5 or 4.6 uh, billion years. So uh, indeed, so the, this question was not really known. So if you just take a test particle in the solar system and you inject it uh, and let it only interact through gravity, uh, you know, this question was not known. How long does it survive? How does its sort of density and orbit evolve? Um, over time. And so that's uh, what I'm studying with, with the student at NYU and Robert Lazenby um, at, at Stanford. And so uh, that's the main question we want to ask. So how big is this uh, tau number? And we also want to ask some ancillary questions like how does the density evolve? Because maybe there could be annual modulation effects that can help detection on Earth and distinguish it, let's say, from dark matter. Um, so uh, what I'll show here is a uh, this is a top view of the solar system. Again, Venus, uh, Earth, Mars, and, and Jupiter, uh, and then two side views. And so the, the colored orbits are the ones that these particles are emitted on. And as you can see, sort of from the side views, you can see angular momentum is not conserved and you undergo these light of cosi oscillations. Uh, but at least over you know, this 
is time in millions of years, um, the semi-major axis is broadly conserved, right? So, so the orbital elements change, except for semi-major axis is, is quite stable. And you can also see that angular momentum in the Z direction uh, does not change by very much. And here, for example, there's these funny orbits with the black one that's uh, undergoing very rapid perihelion precession is because it's traversing the sun and it sees a non over our potential. So we modified the uh, IS uh, integrator and the rebound uh, package to include a non one over our potential. Um, IS unrelated to this IS. Uh, so uh, yeah, so, so what we're doing is basically injecting test particles in the solar system with effectively uh, Venus, Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn in it, because we, we have reasons to believe that the other planets are basically negligible. So a few thousand of them here, I'm only plotting uh, a, plot of a few fewer. So this is semi-major axis here in units of AU. And here is time where this, this is equal zero, and that's 100 million years just for, uh, this was a test run. And so you can see in the inner solar system, so orbits that are just barely Venus crossing, uh, the orbits are extremely stable. So over 100 million years, semi-major axis basically doesn't change. Um, when, when you're sort of, uh, the higher you go, the, the more rapid the change in semi-major axis becomes, and you, it's not quite a random walk because uh, there's motional resonances, et cetera, uh, but, but it does quite change and it, it drifts over time. If you're, once you're at a semi-major axis beyond 2.6 AU or even, you know, somewhat close to that, uh, you get ejected very quickly just by slingshots from, from Jupiter. And quickly, I mean uh, uh, about a million years or so, on the time scale of a million years. So, so all of the ejected part test particles in that test run started at large semi-major axis, and those get ejected quickly once they hit sort of 2.5, 2.6 AU, and they can cross Jupiter's orbit, they get slingshot at that. But, but no, no particles in the inner solar system, at least in these test runs, were ejected. Um, and so um, what, what you can do, or one test we did, was take our, our full run and look for fractional changes in semi-major axis. Again, this is kind of small, but, but let's say this is an order one change in semi-major axis where, where the energy goes up on, on the right, they go down. And here, this is one part in a billion change at semi major axis over a time step of a thousand years. So, even over a thousand years, so for orbits near Earth, the typical change in energy fractionally is one part in 10 to the three. So, and because it's a random walk uh, over a billion years, that should lead uh, to, some inter to, to some change in the, in the profile, and, uh, but, but not too significantly. Um, and uh, I'm not showing it here, but, but this is consistent with just uh, gravitational scattering with close encounters. So we have some an analytic approximation uh, for, for these density plots that agrees quite well. Um, so so the, this, these are our preliminary results. So right now we think that the effective accumulation time is 1.2 billion years. So uh, this is actually uh, runs that were done by, by Robert, and I'm running some verification runs still. Um, so Robert uh, had two ways of simulating it. So one suite of simulations, he did forward runs. So he started, he integrated the solar system backwards 4.6 billion years, uh, and then um, forwards again, uh, injecting particles at, uh, at uh, sort of randomly as he went along, integrating forward, and then Checking how many times all of these particles, uh, all of these particles cross Earth, and and the number of crossings is a proxy for the density. And so from that, uh, and including the ejections and and drifts in semi-major axis, you can infer the effective density. And so from the uh, forward runs, uh, he had a lower bound on this tau uh, of 1.1 billion years, and it's a lower bound instead of an estimate because the forward runs. Uh, did not yet finish, so so there were a lot of there was, there was some survival bias in these runs. Uh, it should be small, but so we have a lower bound. And if you look at yeah, this, maybe not not so important, but basically the the, the velocity phase space equilibrates uh, quite efficiently. So initially you get emitted on these radial orbits, but then they broadly circularize 
and becoming some sort of quasi equilibrium uh, where the full 3D ball and velocity phase space is occupied. Um, not not quite, so, but 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 uh, but yeah, to to first order, that's a good approximation. And the the, the second set of runs he did was basically integrate backwards. So instead of absorbing the particle at Earth, uh, you know, with, with time running forwards, he emitted the particle from Earth in random directions. So, so these are all the directions that he emitted them from. And then he checked the rate of uh, sun crossing. So every time you cross the sun, you would have had a chance in the past to have been emitted uh, by the sun. And, and you can get some proxy again for, for tau, which is in agreement um, with this lower bound. Um, and so if you add up all of the runs, so uh, the green ones are the forward simulations, which have some survival bias, as I said. Um, the unbiased backward simulation, so we started with 256 test particles, and that's where you get the 1.4 billion year estimate from. We started uh, many more backward simulations. There is, again, a tiny survivor bias still. But if, if we are conservative, uh, we take this narrow peak as the sort of fiducial tau, and we get 1.2 billion years. Um, how am I doing this time? Not good. So let me, let me show you uh, this plot here. So if so, this is uh, just the summary again. If, if I now take the axion mass from 100, K, uh, 100 EV to 100 KV, and I plot the density as a function of these couplings, right? So if, if I take uh, for this um, purple curve, let's say, a coupling of 10 minus 12, then the local density as a function of axion mass and this basin uh, is 10 minus 2 GeV per centimeter cubed. And it's a bit faint, but, but this, this line here would be the local dark matter density. So even compared to the dark matter density, it's, it's quite substantial. So for this coupling, I get a, non-relativistic populations of axions. They're produced by the sun, but just by coincidence, their local density is about the same as the dark matter density. So they smell like dark matter, and they kind of look like dark matter, but they're not, right? They're produced in the sun. So independent of cosmological considerations and production mechanisms, I can produce them in the sun and try to look for them with detectors built to look for dark matter axions. This is a coincidence, right? Or is there something? So if you compute the local energy density uh, and compare it to the energy density if you from, from the photon flux outside, it's it's 10%. So the, the kilowatt per square meter you get from the sun is, if you convert that into energy units, is 10% uh, the local dark matter density. And so it, it's, it is, that is a coincidence, obviously, but uh, but 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 if 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 you knew that you know we can't change the sun by let's say ten percent in terms of anomalous cooling, uh, then it's not a coincidence, right? Because because this flux is kind of related to to uh, yeah to the photon flux. So so roughly, I think for a coupling of ten to the minus eleven or so, you would change the the cooling of the sun by order one, uh, and and at, on the red line, the flux. The yeah at this peak here, the the yeah the, the flux in axions would be comparable to the flux in photons, and so so you're using that prior coincidence of the local. But these these are also the this tau increments coming into mm -hmm. so that if the plans were completely different, you could have gone yeah yeah that. sure so so um it's but, but that's the line I skipped so if forget about the tau so so. This, this was an old graph I made before I knew what that was. Um, if you just take the relativistic flux for massless axions, that's the, the black curve here. And so uh, the current bound, so, so if, if you didn't know about white dwarfs and red giants, if I cranked up, so here I took, evaluated at the bound of white dwarfs and, and red giants. If I cranked up the coupling, let's say to uh, 10 to the minus 10 or so, then I would get a relativistic flux of order the local dark matter density. Uh, so yeah, and that's independent of tau, right? And, and that's at the point where you have an order one change to the solar cooling. Uh, yeah, so it's not exactly like the ratio of this peak to that flux depends on tau. And it is, as I promised before, uh, it is as I promised before, like 10, 
uh, uh, 10 to the three or so, right? Because if, if tau is a, a million years, then, then they're the same. Is it possible to find a system or like, you know, tune the parameter in such a way that most of these um, axioms would stay and produce like gravitationally significant cloud? So, um, no, because, um, so, for, so this process occurs around every single object. Uh, the gravi it's never gravitationally significant, because if you think about it, it comes from a process like, uh, uh, like Compton production or Bremsstrahlung. So what you're doing is you're taking thermal energy, kinetic energy in the sun, not rest mass energy, kinetic energy, and you're making you're making uh, new particles that then indeed have some gravitational influence. But the total amount of mass in this axion basin could at most be the thermal energy of the sun multiplied by a small number, which is this V escape cubed, right? Because most of the flux flux goes away. Uh, so, so gravitational perturbations are very tiny. There's one instance, maybe, let's say the host taylor pulsar, if both one or both pulsars and it have a basin there, their gravitational potentials are very deep. One could consider maybe looking for this fluffy axion cloud around that system, um, but it's not a home run. It's very small compared to the rest of mass energy. Um, yeah, um, okay. 20 minutes. So, so basically, we have density around the sun, including locally at Earth, and now we can look for it with dark matter detectors. Um, so one, one dark matter detector one can use is these uh, liquid xenon TPCs, these type ejection chambers. So what can happen, just a brief summary, is you uh, this axion particle goes through, and uh, if it's a KAV and rest mass energy, it can be absorbed on, onto a xenon atom and effectively Upon that absorption, ionize uh, a xenon atom, uh, producing a bunch of electrons and some scintillation light. So you get a flash of light. Uh, when, when you ionize that uh, xenon atom, that's called this S1 signal. And then these electrons drift uh, through the chamber because you put some drift field. Uh, and then uh, they get accelerated here and produce another uh, burst of light that, that gives you some localization. Um, so uh, those are all of the events. The fiducial volume is in the red box. And uh, you can use this S1 light signal and this S2 signal to discriminate against backgrounds. And so what the xenon Montan experiment found, for example, was uh, something consistent with uh, uh, radioactive backgrounds. They, they did find a tentative excess, which I think now is discredited, but that's kind of uh, the search you do. So you look for tens of events uh, in a liquid xenon chamber. Um, they thought it was potentially due to a solar axion, one of the relativistic ones. So they thought um, perhaps there would be axions produced by the sun just passing through once, not in a bound orbit. That's uh, completely disallowed. Uh, basically, if you know this this red curve here would be in a slice of models in this blue banana here. So this is the electron coupling, the photon coupling, and the coupling to nuclei. But the only allowed parameter space is basically where all the couplings are zero. Uh, 3D plotting is difficult. Let's do a 2D plot. So photon coupling, electron coupling. To to reproduce something like that, you would have to be in the in the red sort of corner band, but the only allowed parameter spaces is blue turquoise thing. Um, yeah. So um, the same search also looks, so that the excess is due, is kind of at two or three kV. So they, in fact, I mean, a plausible interpretation would just be dark matter absorption, just because the density is, is much higher and that would be consistent with these cooling bounds. So my claim now is that this was the parameter space before I knew what the tau was. So this is the uh, axion uh, coupling to electrons. That's the mass. Uh, so um, yep. So and these are the same cooling bounds that I showed before. So if xenon Montan saw a solar axion, that you would have to live. In this red band here, which, as I said before, is like way into these uh, cooling constraints. So this is uh, grossly excluded already. 
Xenon 1 fun and other experiments have looked for dark matter particles. So, and then they've said more stringent constraints, assuming that the particles are dark matter on these couplings. If you interpret the excess that way, it would be consistent with some parameter space in that in that gray box. Um, but from recasting these experiments into these population of bound orbits, uh, a new limit is this uh, blue curve that I drew drew here, and the excess uh, could have plausibly been from something that's just below the cooling constraints. Although I wouldn't take it too seriously. And so with all of the simulations. Um, that uh, our new strong bound, so taking the 1.2 billion years, our new bound is, is that blue curve, um, which again is reinterpreting that xenon one ton experiment. Uh, xenon n ton is presently running, so they're, they've already taken. Uh, I don't understand. Your yeah. bound is less stringent than the. It's less stringent, but it's independent of. So, so this bound here assumes that they are dark matter particles. And in fact, it's it's somewhat problematic because uh, if you assume that they're dark matter, they're everywhere, and they can also decay to photons. And we we would have if you're if you're anywhere above uh, like five to tens of keV, we it's it, the parameter space for dark matter is inconsistent with X-ray observations of X-ray galactic background. So, I'm, so in some sense, the dark matter limits, especially at high masses. Are not really consistent, right? This blue blue bound is a reinterpretation of their dark matter search, but independent of of the particles being dark matter. Um, and and this will come down as the experiment improves. So xenon n ton is should have three times lower background and six times more exposure. Um, so in a year or so, these bounds are potentially discoveries. But anyway, but uh, the sensitivity will be. The thing to be in order to explain these excess, where is it? It's in the same spot as the dark matter, right? No, no. So it's a, it's a little bit stronger coupling, right? Because I have less a lower density, mm -hmm. uh, so so I need a slightly larger coupling to explain the same signal. But my point is that the coupling, yes, it has to be larger, but it's still consistent. If you didn't assume that it was dark matter, and and you assume that it was there. Uh, you know their solar axion explanation there, then you have to be um, then you have to be in that red band which was excluded, right? Then you have to be here. So my claim is that if you're looking for solar axions, at least in a region around the KEV, you do better than their fiducial sensitivity by a factor of ten or so. Uh, and you're also looking for a line instead of a broad spectrum. That's the point. Um, so, uh, I'll, that was the case study for axions. Um, I'll just go over this quickly. Everything holds the same way for, for these dark photons, uh, in fact, more dramatically. So there's some details on the production process. It can be resonant. It, it doesn't, uh, I don't have time to explain it now, but, but, uh, this can lead to for example, uh, this epsilon of uh, 10 minus 14 prior to our analysis was not yet excluded. And in this case, uh, if you're close to this resonant production curve, so around 300 electron volts, you could in fact have a larger density than the dark matter density. So that was uh, just locally. Um, and uh, so our current constraints on dark photons now look like this. So in this case, uh, we exclude a huge, uh, we exclude new huge uh, regions of uh, dark photon parameter space. So this is the coupling as a function of mass, and and it goes over a broader range from ten electron volts to to tens tens of uh, keV. So there's some small notches uh, where we now have the strongest dark matter independent bound, and then a big region around here around a, a keV or so, and another small notch there. Um, but previously, for example, points here were still allowed. Uh, and at a point here, we would get a dark matter density that, that was larger than, sorry, we would get a bound axion energy density that was larger than the dark matter energy density. Um, and so, so yeah, the, the blue curve is now a new constraint with future experiments like 
to proceed EMS, the sensitivity would improve uh, better still. And again, these dark photons are kind of, they're, they're, they don't decay to x-rays, so that, that, that uh, consideration is out of the picture, but they are somewhat hard to produce in the early universe. So, so looking for them in a, a cosmology independent way is, uh, is interesting because they need not be dark matter. And in, in fact, in many dark matter models being looked for right now, this dark photon is, kind of, is the mediator. So if you have uh, in many dark matter models, um, if you say that the dark matter is some part high uh, that, that's, that uh, interacts with the standard model particle, often the, 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 the most efficient way of coupling them is through uh, this uh, A prime that uh, kinetically mixes with the photon. So even if a mu is not dark matter, the dark matter is chi, dark matter still couples typically or often via dark photons. So um, it's important to, to figure out what the constraints are on, on the couplings of, of those particles. Um, you can ask me about this later. Uh, I just want to quickly sketch out the, another way of detecting these, these types of particles. So I've talked about detecting them directly in the lab, right? Uh, but, one, but one could also try to look for them indirectly from their uh, the case. So as I said, the density falls off as one over r to the fourth, but that does mean that very close to the sun, the, the density is enormous, uh, much, much larger than the um, uh, dark matter density for, for typical couplings. So what one can do is just look at the solar limb. So if, if one looks uh, an angle theta away from the sun, so if I, um, if I, let's say uh, we are here and we, uh, this is staring straight at the sun. If we look some angle theta away from the sun, um, if the density falls off as one over r to the fourth, the flux will fall off as one over theta cubed. Um, and in fact, the, this axion decay to two photons for couplings uh, that are, that are they're typical in this in this range. The lifetime can be about uh, the, the age of the sun. So here, the lifetime would be about four giga years. Uh, if the coupling is in sort of a not not yet excluded range, and the mass is ten kb, um, and the flux falls off as one over theta cubed, as I said. Uh, and then there's this uh, limb brightening, so this factor of two discontinuity at, at the solar limb. And so what one, one can do is just look at the solar limb here where the flux is maximized uh, at, yeah, for, well, with X-ray telescopes like New Star. So, so the signature would be a photon at half the, with energy of order half the mass of the axion. Um, we calibrated the uh, New Star observations um, when the sun was bright. And then we had a, uh, we used archival data from, from the New Star X-ray satellite uh, when the sun was was very quiet, um, and we used data from from this first orbit where this, where new star was not passing through the cephalonic anomaly. So this was about fifteen hundred seconds of observations, uh, and uh, we did three separate analyses. A very dumb one: the total number of photons uh, in the data. Uh, well, the the, the 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 total amount of signal should not have exceeded the total data observed. Uh, we used a, a background independent um, model that exploited the, the spectral and, and spatial features of the signal uh, uh, proposed by, by Yellen. And we also did a, a, a likelihood analysis where we tried to model the background. Uh, but that was quite tough. So, so these are the observed events. So we stared. So this is the sun. And uh, new, uh, not we, new star stared at the limb of the sun when, when the sun was quiet for some time. Uh, so, so this is just an exposure effectively. The colors are our energy. So, so yellow is low energy. So you see there's a, a few yellow spots. There, those were tiny flares of the sun. Um, sun was also moving throughout the exposure a little bit. Um, but more or less, so other than these yellow flares, so above 6 kV or so, all of these photons uh, are likely um, uh, extra galactic the cosmic X-ray background. So uh, X-ray photons that didn't pass through the uh, optical system and just hit the uh, detector uh, unfocused. 
How is it possible if the, the XRB was discovered by moon blocking it? So the sun should be blocking the extragalactic background. Yes, but but so most of so there there is a focused cosmic X-ray background. All of this stuff is unfocused. So so New Star has this, um, I guess bug. I mean it's kind of unavoidable. So so this is my my schematic uh, interpretation of New Star. So there there's a large beam here with uh, some X-ray focusing elements, right? And it's staring it's staring at the sun. Um, Okay. And so we look for signal photons from here, but there's just uh, a lot of solid angle where yeah. uh, where cosmic X-rays uh, come through. So that's what we see. So the, yes, there is some blocking, but but uh, the most of it is uh, unfocused cosmic X-rays. And this is what our signal would look like in image space. So we expect uh, a, br a bright signal at the limb just outside the edge of the sun. Um, and it would also be a line in energy space. So this is the observed spectrum. Uh, and what we're looking for is, is a peak uh, at half. So for an axion of 15 kV, we're, we're looking for a narrow peak at seven and a half. Uh, so, so this panel would be a zoom, is a zoom in of, of that little slice here, seven and a half kV. Uh, the green is our best fit model for what the unfocused cosmic X-ray background is. The focused cosmic X-ray background, which would be blocked by the sun, is, is quite a bit lower. It's a factor of 10 or 100 lower, I forget precisely. We, we didn't even try to model it. Um, yeah. Uh, so what we do is we marginalize over the background, and, and we try to set a limit on the signal flux. Um, we're under subtracted because we can't model the solar flares. It's very difficult. So one cannot trust our data. Uh, at low masses. So this is a total signal flux normalized to the center of the sun. So at, at, low, free, at low masses, uh, this analysis is, should not be trusted basically because of the flaring, uh, but at high masses, uh, it does reasonably well. So <laughs> these are our, our full limits. So if you uh, look at the photon coupling as a function of mass, uh, with our three three analyses. So Poisson is just saying, okay, our signal should not have been larger than all of the data combined. Uh, that simple limit already is quite good. And one does uh, a little bit better if, with more sophisticated methods. Uh, and so again, we set a, set a new limit. We didn't see a signal, um, or at least not a convincing one. And we set new limits that are a factor of, even with, I mean, again, this is just a 1500 second exposure. Uh, and our limits are better than the previous constraints by, by more than a factor of 10. Um, and so, um, yeah, so this is for purely the photon coupling. Uh, and in fact, yeah, thanks for the question. This is on this axion decay constant F, right? So, so here F uh, is the same F that, uh, that I circled here, right? Um, and so, so again, so this is the, coupling to photons, coupling to electrons. And so, as I said before, one typically lives on a sort of line where they're correlated. Um, and so I think I'll, uh, I'll finish here with the summary of uh, our, our new constraints. So, so above here, uh, oh, sorry, not this one. Um, yeah, so um, here on the left, I'm showing the, our new direct detection constraints and on the right, the indirect detection constraints from the decays of axions to, the photon. So I think these stellar basins in, in general will be the leading probe of, of a KV uh, mass particles and a few orders of magnitude uh, around it uh, in the next few years. Thank you. So I have a question about this uh, thing you didn't want to discuss, uh -huh. <laughs> which is the anomalous cooling of white dwarfs. So I know about the anomalous heating of white dwarfs where they don't cool enough and they get stuck on the so-called Q branch. What's the anomalous cooling evidence? Do you remember like what the thrust of it was? There, there's two ways to look for, uh, or two ways that, that people have looked at, at cooling by new particles. One is looking at the shape of the luminosity function of white dwarfs, uh, where you have to make some assumptions about the birth rate, et cetera. And the progenitors that I don't think those show a hint. Uh, I mean, some people claim it's yeah. Most most groups agree those don't show a hint. The ones that do show a hint is these uh, P 
period drifts analysis. So, so one can can look for uh, one can look for the change in temperature, so the cooling rate, uh, through looking at the the um, pulsations of a white dwarf and, and looking at the change in period there. And the claim it's claimed there that the period changes by too much, indicating some new source of cooling. Uh, but it, it seems to be, I mean, it seems to be inconsistent with For the period of individual. Yeah, or, or a handful of, of white dwarfs that are well. The period is changing due to cooling so fast that you can see it. Uh, that's the claim. That's the claim. But it seems kind of like Paul says they're super accurate clocks. So uh, if you're monitoring them for a few years, you do see some P dot. Yeah. And so I'm yeah, the, saying that the, the P dot is observed, and I guess it disagrees with models. Um, so, so even just the cooling from photons is observed, and this would be a rather small perturbation on it. Um, yeah. Just look it up, yeah. But one, one needs to know the, yeah. the structure of a white dwarf very well uh, to say those things. So, uh, yeah. Um, so in, in the case, for example, of a neutron star, you basically capture a vast majority of the- Order one. Order, order one. Is there some indirect uh, signature that one might, maybe the mass you said is very small? I don't know. Mm -hmm. is what, uh, 10 to minus two, 10 to yeah. minus three. What is it? So, in fact, there's a, one, something that I skipped. No, it's, it's not that. It's basically, basically, think about it this way every, every um, neutron is about a GeV in mass, yeah. but the initial temperature was. Well, let's say the temperature today is maybe tens of keV. Yeah, yeah, but when it was born, let's say collision of two neutron stars. That, that yeah, yeah. Then it was thirty MeV, and yeah. and and so then you could get you know thirty MeV over a GeV in terms of uh, mass times some factors of the escape velocity, which is not that small. So it, it could be substantial. What does happen, which is quite interesting, I, I didn't I didn't mention. Um, so, uh, but it was evident here. So here is the dark photon energy density locally, locally on Earth, very far away from the sun. And so notice as I increase the coupling, basically the density goes up quadratically because the emission process goes up quadratically. But at some point here, you see I'm saturating. So I'm increasing by, by a factor of 10, the coupling, but the density remains the same. So at some point, you achieve detailed balance. You get to a, you get to a point where the occupation number Achieve is that of a max uh, of a uh, Bose Einstein distribution. So the, the thing you and, and here I'm, I'm showing it. So so you effectively saturate. Uh, do I have it? I think I have it here. So if this is a Bose Einstein uh, occupation number for the core temperature, and so basically you, you equilibrate, uh, you equilibrate, you equilibrate to the red curve at, at very large coupling. Which is um, yeah, which is roughly related to some radius average temperature. So you don't quite as the neutron star cools. Yes, initially the density is very large, but then those axions get reabsorbed uh, as the because because at some point the neutron star cools and 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 you get reabsorbed. I have thought about one thing that could be very cool, which is uh, let's say when when a neutron star is formed. Uh, so, so let's say there's some. This assumes that they keep in an orbit that goes back to the center. Right? Yes, yes, exactly. So, so that's the key point. So, so let's say you had some progenitor star um, that is, was very really hot in the core. Let's say a billion Kelvin uh, for a short period of time. You produce these massive particles, and a, a huge amount of energy is stored in this in this basin. Um, and when the planet is around, uh, when the star is around, maybe it has some planets or other companions or, or convections here uh, that cause these orbits to circularize. So you have a significant amount of energy in this basin and circular orbits. Then if the, then if the star goes supernova, then the uh, neutron star gets a kick. And these, this axion basin is so, so tightly coupled to the neutron star that it moves with it. So after some time, one may have a neutron star with yeah, these the orbits that traverse the neutron star, these will be absorbed, but there may be a significant population of circular orbits that remain and sort of they're like a reservoir of energy. If then the neutron star encounters a gravitational perturbation, if it's in a dense environment, then that could 
cause a, a heating of a neutron star later on in its life. That might be an interesting signature to look for, sort of these anomalous heating events of very old neutron stars, but... Uh, but it's not an event, right? It would be super slow because the coupling is so weak, right? Like they would be slow, there would be like a loss cone of orbits into the star. So, so, but for a neutron star, these processes are so efficient. So for a neutron star, the, I mean, for the same Fs that I'm talking about, basically you achieve detailed balance and order one occupation number on a time scale of uh, hours or minutes. Oh, wow. Astrophysically, it would be very short. And the reason is, the main process is um, uh, 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 bremsstrahlung, but from pion exchange. So these are very large couplings, and then emission of an axion. But you see, it, it, it's proportional to a scattering rate, and so it's proportional to the density squared. And the density in a neutron star is so high that these are extremely efficient emitters of these particles uh, or absorbers. Uh, Right, so so that's that's uh, something I'm looking at. So yeah, in general, I mean, I, I left it off of my slide, but uh, what I'm thinking about is indirected production by white dwarfs, and um, yeah, maybe maybe other other compactor nets. Neutron stars are so efficient at producing these things and trapping them. Uh, I think, yeah, that deserves some further thought. And could could they decay if there's say a big one? You've Collide to neutron stars. Yes, it's very hard. You emit a lot of them, and yes. there's a magnetic field. So could well, they decay? They decay. Yeah, yeah. So could one can do that? indirect. Do an X. I don't know. So an X-ray. Uh, an X-ray line. So yeah. So I mean, for um, uh, here. So even white dwarfs, right? So series. This is series B. So um, the one of the next few things I want to do is use X-ray telescopes instead of looking at the sun, looking at white dwarfs and neutron stars, um, and uh, any anything that's roughly green colored would give you ten to minus sixteen Earths per, per second per centimeter squared on Earth, and so that would be detectable. Yeah, with neutron stars too, but you have to look at them right away, right away, or hope or hope that there's some orbits that are. Uh, circular and survive for a long time. Yeah, these circular orbits though, if you think of the thing on the left hand side as a circular disk, yeah. when you give the neutron star a kick, you'll actually form an eccentric disk. It right, right. Disk. So yeah, yeah. So the kick will perturb the circular orbit somewhat, but some will have enough angular momentum that they don't cross the this the surface of the neutron star. And then by angular momentum conservation, if you know the neutron star is Sufficiently symmetric, and there's no companions, then 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 a substantial fraction of the orbits should should remain uh, circular. But that's I mean, should this is as much calculation bound, we we bound bound and outside of the star, but bound and remain perihelion or peri um, peri aspheron outside of the, the star. Yeah. So so with the initial initial uh, uh, distribution in the phase space in the sun would affect the resonance time of them in the so, uh, to leading order, no. Um, so yeah, so indeed, for example, this, um, so between those two cases, we've done some studies of this. So, so I, I showed you the, uh, the axion, the axion production case. So for example, here, this process, the axion production process is primarily in the very core, uh, whereas this dark photon production, depending on the mass, it could it could primarily occur at this resonance, which is you know which could be in the core, but it could also be on the outskirts. And we we've, we've checked, and it doesn't really depend on where where it is emitted in the sun. In, in the velocity space, it's also good. So the velocity space is, is universal. The velocity space comes from the velocity space comes from here. Uh, so in fact. Uh, Sorry, this clicky thing is not very efficient. The velocity space comes from integrals like this, right? So, and, it, and it's universal under a few assumptions. So all of the derivations on the slide, like this one over r to the fourth, et cetera, come from the fact that, so come from one assumption, which is that as I take the limit of the three momentum going to zero, so just at threshold production, so this omega becomes the mass. And what I'm assuming is that this matrix element does not go to zero, but just approaches a constant as k goes to zero. 
And if that's true, everything else in this integral that I didn't write, like momentum conserving, energy functions, et cetera, the others, it's basically like a spectator that doesn't, the, the whole process doesn't care about this free momentum as long as the matrix element is not suppressed. So that, that would tell you that at every emission point, you emit in a 3D ball uniformly in phase space because the rest doesn't depend on K. Yeah, up, up to the escape velocity. And it, I mean, well, everywhere, but, but above the escape velocity, you don't see that. And that's precisely what gives you the one over R to the fourth. Yeah. Yeah. So for your solar limb experiment, mm -hmm. um, uh, is, there is another flux distribution from the, the solar wind scattering the X ray emission from the corona. There's a little bit solar wind that's not huge, but mm -hmm. it's mass loss from the sun, which carries electrons, and those electrons can scatter the corona emission, the basically like quiescent emission from the sun. Yes, yes. Is that something significant? Maybe it's a very low flux that yeah. we're not worried about. It's it's low. It's a good question. Uh, it uh, well, you can't really see it, but basically. Our combination of models, so this B1 is the cosmic X-ray background, the yellow one is radioactivity inside the detector, uh, purple is some, some polynomial, some continuum fitting function. But if I were to, this is, I cut it off at 4 keV, but if you, if you look at the total reported counts, so new star is calibrated up to 3 keV, um, but uh, but it records data down to 1.5. And if I show the, the whole data, what you see is just the rising slope. Uh, and indeed, that's so that's a lot of the, the, the process you mentioned and then the solar flares. Yeah. Yeah. So that occurs there. Uh, so at, at low energies, basically, it's impossible to model, right? Because it's intermittent, it happens in random places. Uh, like even these in the data that we have. Um, these, these, sorry, it's next. It's these, these flares happen at random times and random places. So it's impossible to model. So that's why in some the sun is very close and the signal is bright, but it's very difficult to improve on this analysis because we are background limited and uh, it's impossible to model at, at lower, lower energies. Um, but other stars are interesting because they're much more efficient at emitting these particles and they should have lower backgrounds and they could have higher temperatures so you can look for other masses. Um, yeah. And you can stack them. So you can take all, all X-ray observations, X-ray exposures of white dwarfs and stack them. That's next. Any more questions? Do we have any questions on Zoom? Seems not. Given, let's think. Can we